Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? I'll, I'll make it, I'll be very intentional about leaning in and uh, I know me and my presentation are standing between you and the most elusive of agenda items, end of day. So I'll, uh, I appreciate you being here, sticking around uh, for my presentation. Uh, so again, my name's Chris Knapp. I'm an accessibility consultant and tester. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about what I'm describing as a new uh, reviewer-friendly VPAT, or Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. Uh, again, I'm here representing Sakai, which is an open source learning management system. Uh, and I'd planned on spending at least part of this presentation talking to you about our multi-year effort to develop and implement uh, community sourced uh, accessibility strategy that eventually led to us being able to pr produce our own VPAT uh, but unfortunately, with some of the time constraints, um, I'm going to have to scale back on some of that. I'll touch on a little bit of it, but not as much as I'd like. Uh, but after the conference, I do encourage you to go back and review my slides, and especially uh, the additional content that I've included on my speaker's notes. But instead, I'd like to use the rest of the time that we have left together to walk you through some of the, through some of the steps that we use to reimagine and reinvent our VPAT process and report uh, with the VPAT reviewer audience in mind. And hopefully by the end of my presentation, you'll have at least some high level concepts that you'll be able to apply to your respective free and open source software projects uh, if any of you are interested in trying to replicate our approach to this work. All right, so uh, we okay still up there? Okay, I'm getting a weird message here. All right, why? Are we? Okay, here we go, sorry guys. So this is my not so subliminal advertising slide for my consulting business, my accessibility testing service, and my blog. Um, of course, I'm, I'm joking, but for purposes of this presentation, there are just a few things that I uh, thought would be important for you to know about me. Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, I should mention that I'm statutorily blind. I have a prosthetic left eye, left eye and uh, 8 200 vision in the lower periphery of my right eye. And we don't have a lot of time to go into the circumstances that led me uh, led to me becoming disabled. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that for most of my adult life, I've had to rely on screen readers and other assistive technology to interact with the web, uh, which I think provides some important context and hopefully speaks to the practical real world experience that I bring to my role as an embedded accessibility expert. Um, and second, I'm not a technologist by trade. Uh, I spent the first 15 years of my professional career in workforce development and only recently got into accessibility consulting and testing when I launched my Accessiversity accessibility testing service back in 2019. Whoops, let's see here. All right. So we don't really have time to go through all this information about VPATs. Uh, so again, so I encourage you to come back and review this information after, uh, when you get a chance. Uh, but if you are not familiar with what a VPAT is, uh, basically a VPAT is a tool for performing an accessibility assessment of an, of an information technology uh, or communication uh, technology product, with the end goal being an accessibility conformance report that describes the extent to which the product applies with various accessibility standards. Uh, the other thing on this slide that I'll point out is that the VPAT template was uh, developed by the Information Technology Industry Council, and it's free to use as long as you adhere to their usage guidelines. So it's proprietary, but only from the standpoint of promoting accurate and consistent reporting. Uh, while also protecting the VPAT name and template, which are registered uh, service marks of the in uh, Information Technology Industry Council. 
All right, so this slide depicts several key, key milestones that have occurred over the past four years. Uh, and about, basically represents the time that I've been involved with Sakai. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, I am going to try to quickly summarize what is here because I think it uh, provides some important context for the rest of my talk. So my involvement with Sakai started in 2020. Uh, that's when Chuck Severance, who is Sakai's chief architect and currently serves as the Sakai PMC chair, had first uh, approached me about getting involved with Sakai. Chuck's approach, which proved to be genius, was to embed me with Sakai's QA team, uh, where I was to start evaluating the current state of accessibility for uh, Sakai, not just the accessibility of the Sakai LMS product itself, but accessibility across every facet of the open source Sakai community. So I started working as a member of the Sakai QA team and began to make recommendations about how to make the various tools and processes that we were using more accessible. I created our first real substantive accessibility test script and began to perform screen reader and keyboard testing to supplement some of the efforts of our other QA testers. Then about three months into our little experiment, we established a partnership with VisionAid, which provides IT training to blind and low vision uh, individuals in India. And suddenly we tripled the number of blind and low vision testers working on Sakai. Around the same time, we began piloting a new initiative that we call Accessibility Light, which involves having some sighted users go through an adapted uh, version of our accessibility test script in perform keyboard testing. So when the time came for our, uh, us to do a VPAT for Sakai 21, our expanding accessibility team had plenty to contribute uh, based on the extensive user, uh, user testing that we had been performing over the prior six months. And while our work was used to supplement and definitely improve the VPAT and authoring process, we ultimately decided to utilize an outside contractor to create the Sakai 21 VPAT. But by the time of the Sakai 22 release, we had built up enough of uh, the accessibility resources within our community that we made the decision to try and utilize internal resources to create our own VPAT, which is exactly what we ended up doing. All right. All right. All right. So throughout my presentation, I'm going to be jumping back and forth between two key resources, uh, the Sakai 22 VPAT and then the Sakai Accessibility Strategy page on our Sakai LMS website, which is shown here. Uh, on this page, you can find all the information about our Sakai Accessibility Strategy, including the Sakai 22 VPAT, which you can access down here in the Accessibility Conformance uh, Report section. All right, so this is going to be one of the reoccurring themes uh, throughout my presentation. While the goal was always to be able to produce our own VPAT, at the end of the day, some 30 or so pages of paper are not as important as the underlying strategy that's helping to drive all of this work. If you don't retain anything else from my talk today, at least remember to go to that page on the Sakai LMS website and read about our Sakai accessibility strategy because it's an absolute critical component to all of this work. All right, so again, I won't spend too much time on this particular slide uh, other than to point out that there are several different versions of the VPAT depending on the specific accessibility standard you are needing to assess for. Uh, there are specific versions for web content accessibility guidelines, revised Section, 50, uh, Section 508 standards, EN 301-549 uh, European harmonized standards, and then there is an international version which incorporates all of these standards into a single report template. Ultimately, the decision on w about which version of the VPAT to use boils down to uh, your target audience and what specific industries and markets are priorities to you. All right, so as we start going through some of the specific changes that we implemented to make our VPAT more reviewer friendly, 
The first thing I want to talk about is this content or contact information uh, area at the beginning of the VPAT report template. And let me just pause and acknowledge that I know some of these slides are idea for or ideal for a setting like this. Uh, and a lot of these are going to be screenshots, uh, text from our VPAT or from the website, and they might be difficult for you to read. Uh, but I kind of put together this slide deck intending for it to be a leave behind uh, piece for people to go back and refer to. So just keep that in mind uh, as we go through here. So, uh, so this is a pretty straightforward one, but I'll just stress that you'll really want to think about who to include here as you would prefer that it's someone who can serve as a single point of content for fielding questions about your VPAT, as well as providing technical assistance about any accessibility related issues users may be experiencing with your product. For us, this meant listing me, uh, but we felt it would be too confusing or tacky for me to use my business email. So we created a shared email using the Sakai LMS domain name choosing to go with accessibility at Sakai LMS to keep it simple and so it'd be p easy for people to remember. So these next two examples are somewhat related in the sense that the first thing I'm gonna be talking about sort of precipitated the need for the next thing I'll be covering. Uh, so this first one comes to us cur courtesy of Gonzalo Silverio from the University of Michigan, who's been serving as our informal VPAT advisor. So Gonzalo, who regularly reviews VPATs as part of his day job at U of M, was the person who had convinced us to cut down on the amount of supporting information we were trying to cram into our VPAT report, saying that the reviewers would thank us for keeping our VPATs as succinct and as clear as possible. He then took it a step further and suggested that we actually included a statement about deliberately keeping the VPAT succinct and clear to signal to the reviewers that we're on their side, uh, like this language that we ended up adopting for the Sakai 22 VPAT. So while we come right out and say that we're doing this to allow folks more time to review our other materials, we're also implying that they'll have to review the supplemental information to get the full picture. So we've technically added to the VPAT report, not by altering the standard VPAT template, but rather by extension. All right. All right, so for those of you who are reading ahead, you'll know that this is also the place in the VPAT where we mention our companion resource for the first time. In our case, the Sakai Accessibility Strategy page on the Sakai LMS website. Basically, this page serves as a catch-all for housing all of the uh, supplemental information that we weren't able to squeeze into the standard VPAT template. In retrospect, this decision, more than anything else, proved to be a real game changer for us. Uh, for the longest time, I had been struggling with how to present all of the many aspects of our accessibility strategy that I wanted to talk about without adding pages and pages of narrative to our VPAT report, which I knew could potentially turn off prospective customers who would have to sift through all of that material. Gonzalo's suggestion of repurposing this information and moving it over to a separate web page proved to be a surprisingly simple solution. Uh, for starters, it freed up more of the scarce real estate within the VPAT report template so we could focus on those essential elements that we needed to, talk, to touch on. And there's also this unintended consequence of freeing ourselves from the shackles of an overly rigid template report uh, when we realized that a separate web page represented a sort of clean slate and we could choose to organize and present the supplement, supplemental information however we'd like. Of course, as we were thinking about how to organize our page, it made sense for us to use a lot of the same headings that match those used in the VPAT report, uh, which we felt would make it easier for people visiting the website to find the additional information about a particular topic they were wanting to learn more about. But at the same time, we could create our own headings that correspond to other aspects of our accessibility strategy if there were these other things that we felt were just as important for a prospective customer to know about. So all of this content easily is uh, neatly indexed 
including a series of jump links that go to each of the different sections. So it's super easy to peruse and allows uh, you know, visitors to control the amount and type of information they are digesting. Whoa. Hold on a second here. I lost my hand grip. All right. So the VPAT report was never intended to be a straight up marketing tool. So you want to avoid turning it into an, an infomercial for your product. Uh, when doing a formal accessibility assessment like this, you wouldn't want to toot your own horn too much anyways, as customers tend to see right through that sort of self-serving analysis. But where does that leave you in terms of talking about those unique attributes of your organization or product that genuinely help you to stand apart in the marketplace, that contrast your offerings with those of your competitors? For example, one of the unique things about the Sakai VPAT is that there's this entire community of people behind this work. Unlike our competitors, we're not just hiring some outside consultancy firm to slap together a VPAT for us, or including some you know, few token uh, disabled users as an afterthought. Our entire community is involved in our accessibility efforts, including the creation of our VPATs. And that's something that is truly unique and definitely is something that's worth calling out. The problem, as I've already kind of alluded to, is that the standard VPAT report template doesn't provide a lot of options for talking about these other aspects of your approach. Instead, on our Sakai accessibility strategy page, we've carved out some space to include a, a few brief write-ups along with some photos to showcase some of these partnerships and extol the benefits of our unique community sourced approach to accessibility. So doing it this way doesn't distract from the VPAT, but you're still able to leverage this other platform to share supplemental information that the customer can use to then guide and inform their decisions. All right, again, this is pretty straightforward, pretty self-explanatory and a relatively easy thing that you can do to help connect the dots for the VPAT reviewer. But when applicable, consider uh, including a link to your companion resource, like we've done here in the evaluation methods uh, use section of the VPAT. On the flip side, uh, we've already mentioned that the link to the Sakai 22 VPAT can be found in the accessibility conformance report section of the uh, Sakai accessibility strategy page. So we've provided multiple ways for users to navigate to and between these resources. Uh, oops. Hopefully I didn't mess something. Oops, I apologize guys. All right, sorry about that. Um, since there were a number, and are we good? Is that showing on the screen still? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. So, so there were a number of different things that we needed to cover in the narrative portion of the VPAT report. Uh, here we too decided to focus on a high level description of the evaluation met methods used, including some quite quantifiable benchmarks that were readily available to us. For us, this included the total number of tools and features evaluated, different types of testing performed, number of screen reader and web browser combinations used, and total number of test cases performed. These metrics are important for several different reasons. For first, assuming that you're continuing to evolve your accessibility strategy, when you look at these numbers from version to version, customers are able to connect the dots to see that there is quantifiable evidence of growth. Uh, for examples, uh, 23 tools and features were tested for Sakai 22, and for Sakai 23, that increased to a total of 29 tools and features. For Sakai 22, there were a total of 2,853 test cases performed, and for Sakai 23, that number increased to 5,106, which was a 179% increase from the prior version. 
Like with Sakai 22, we use four different combinations of screen reader and web browsers when performing our testing for Sakai 23. However, we changed out one of the combinations to allow us to test the voiceover and Safari uh, combination for the first time. So when it comes to existing customers, these sorts of metrics show that you are continuing to uh, make improvements to the product from version to version, which may factor into their decisions on whether or not to renew. And for prospective customers, this sort of transparency can help to establish your track record with them, especially if they view, as you, uh, view you as an unknown commodity. Uh, all right, so since there were a number, oh, I apologize here, I got to, Okay, so now it's not advancing here, so let me see. Huh. Well, I'm stuck here. I don't know how to advance without switching out of here. It's not advancing at all? Let me just do this here. Hmm. I have lost it here. I don't know what I'm doing. Let me try to see if I can get back to where I was. Is that showing the slides now, guys? Yeah, there it is. I apologize for this. This is, contribute this to fat fingers here. Um, let me see what slide this is. Okay. All right, I think we're finally caught up here, so I apologize for that. So whenever you're conducting a formal accessibility assessment, inevitably you're going to uh, come across some less than flattering things about your product. Addressing these uh, sort of known deficiencies can be a sticky subject, uh, but my advice to you is to hit these sorts of things head on. Uh, the word that immediately comes to mind is authenticity. Uh, so when you talk about authenticity as it relates to your accessibility strategy in VPAT, uh, this can mean a couple of different things. Uh, first, and a little bit of a public service uh, message from me, to the extent that you're able, you should try to incorporate individuals with disabilities into your user testing and community. Uh, individuals with disabilities, uh, for example, blind and low vision users who rely on screen readers and other assistive technology, are able to provide for an authentic accessibility experience that even the most well-intentioned, non-disabled developers and designers will never be able to fully replicate. Now, as it relates to putting together your VPAT, don't be afraid to give an honest assessment of your product, warts and all. Uh, no software is perfect, and if you're portraying your pro project as being flawless, either you're being disingenuous or you haven't tested enough. All right, so part of what any current or prospective customer is looking for when reviewing your VPAT is evidence that you're constantly moving the needle, which means that it's incumbent upon you to demonstrate that your product is continuing to evolve from version to version, including talking about what improvements are being planned for future releases. By definition, this will require you to project into the future uh, but since most forward-thinking organizations are already using tools like technical roadmaps, it shouldn't be too difficult to repurpose some of that information for this section of the VPAT report. 
If done right, this can provide your customers with some powerful insight into your past, present, and future accessibility efforts, which can speak volumes about your organization's culture and its ongoing commitment to accessibility. Uh, for this next item, we'll be diving into the WCAG success criteria table of the VPAT report. So the WCAG system for assigning uh, conformance levels is somewhat ambiguous. You can either say that a particular item supports the WCAG success criteria, partially supports it, does not support it, or is not applicable. The problem is, is that there is really no gray area between the supports and partially supports options. It's kind of an all or nothing deal. So for a complex web application like Sakai, with all these different tools and features that, we're, that we end up testing, even if we just find a handful of issues, technically that only partially supports that particular WCAG success criteria. Of course, you can use the explanation and remarks field to provide that additional information and context, but you don't want to overwhelm the reviewer, so you need to keep your comments succinct and use consistent formatting to make it easy for them to, to locate the information that they're needing. So here, we're using one of the, uh, one of the WCAG success criteria from our Sakai 22 VPAT to, to show you the system that we ended up adopting. So the image on the left shows the part of the remarks and explanation field that describes the extent to which the um, Sakai uh, complies with this particular uh, WCAG success criteria, uh, including specific types of issues observed during testing which are preventing us from reaching full compliance. The middle image uh, indicates the uh, types of users impacted and then the image on the far right shows uh, where we list out the specific tools and features where these issues were observed. Uh, so for this next one, uh, we're showing how we were able to incorporate references to our Sakai user guide, allowing us to promote our, our extensive help documentation, which is, again, is another potential spelling point, a selling point for a potential uh, Sakai customer. The distinction here is that we're talking about specific WCAG success criteria that were deemed not applicable because the corresponding feature was not included in Sakai by default and only came into play when there are instances of user-generated content. Of course, at that point, it's up to the individual user to ensure that the content that they're adding is accessible. So to a system, we've included these references to these different help uh, articles on a variety of different accessibility topics. Uh, let's see. All right, and finally, uh, th what this slide is showing is how we were able to insert blanket statements into some of the revised Section 508 and EN 301 549 tables so that we could eliminate some of these unused rows to cut down on some of the clutter in the report. I should pause here to explain that we're using VPAT version 2.4 international which again includes the WCAG revised section 508 and EN 301 549 European harmonized standards all in the same report. The other thing that you need to understand is that for the most part, uh, the WCAG guidelines already are already designed to crosswalk to the revised section 508 and EN 301 549 standards. Uh, and you can see evidence of this uh, crosswalk in this image on the top left, uh, which shows one of the WCA, WCAG success criteria. And if you can notice there where it lists out what the other applicable standards are there. So once you've gone through and completed the WCAG uh, success criteria table, there's really no compelling reason to fill this information out for a second or a third or fourth time unless you're glutton for punishment or you're just really wanting to annoy your VPAT reviewer. So 
when we considered what to do with these other revised Section 508 and EN 301 549 tables, which again are essentially reporting duplicative information, we decided to ins insert a blanket statement like the one shown here at the bottom of the screen and then delete all of the other unused portions of the table. All right, and so that's about all of the time that I had planned uh, to, to be able to show you what I could in that amount of time. So uh, I apologize for the technical uh, snafu there, but um, yeah, thank you for your time and attentive, attentiveness. And if we have time for questions or um, if people want to stick around afterwards, I'm happy to talk with folks. So thank you. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question, and I, if you want, I can repeat it or try to paraphrase it But um, for the recording. But the question was, is when you're doing a VPAT and you're filling it out and you're mentioning known deficiencies, um, is that opening you up for uh, potential liability? Is, is, am I capturing the essence of that? Yeah, so... Um, Again, uh, we, we've been uh, leaning on uh, an individual, Gonzalo Solerio, who is involved early on in, in, um, in Sakai, and uh, he specializes in digital accessibility and uh, working with the University of Michigan. And um, one of the things that he, he really helped me to understand is that, you know, Tech, what these what these accessibility conformance reports are primarily used for is um, when making purchasing and procurement decisions, and so what you're wanting to do is is to just put it all out there to uh, someone who is maybe thinking about using your your product that you know no there, you know there's no no surprises that here we did all this testing. And for the most part, we've either met or exceeded, or in uh, you know the WCAG terms, either we're supporting or partially supporting all of these things. And you know when you when you list out what those known deficiencies are, you know obviously if you have an accessibility strategy that's working in tandem with that, um, you know those are things that are going to continue to be worked on and resolved over time. But, um, you know, software is a living, breathing thing. It's, it's not realistic to think that something's going to be compliant 100% of the time forever. I mean, it's just that's not the reality of it. So, um, you know, putting some of those things that we uncovered during our testing out there as here are known deficiencies, it just helps the customer make an informed decision about if I'm going to go with Sakai and I know that there's this feature, um, like one of our ones that we have listed is we have a hotspot feature in our test and quizzes tool. And it's a very visual, uh, very visual uh, tool. It's, it's something that isn't designed for someone like me that uses a screen reader, but it's often used in different uh, medical disciplines for um, like anatomy, and, you know, like uh, testing medical students on how to, uh, diagnose, you know, different ailments or, you know, different parts of the anatomy. And so you put it out there so that if someone's thinking about using it for a course where they don't need it, then they can either just turn off that feature or try to think of a workaround to, you know, bypass that. Does that help answer your question? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. And 
Uh, it's something that's evolved over the, the four, last four years. I mean, I was dropped into the deep end and I wasn't really, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think the, the dev team was really excited about having this like, you know, person out there like making a bunch of ruckus about, hey, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. But over time, I think they started to understand the value that I was able to bring uh, in, in terms of my contributions. And over time, we've built up those relationships. They figured out how to work with me. I figured out how to work with them. Um, and it started very basic. I mentioned we had to work through like just some of the, you know, different tools and, and processes we were using. Some of those were not 100% accessible. Some of them still aren't. I mean, we use like Etherpad sometimes and it doesn't work with uh, my preferred screen reader and browser. So whenever I go to get onto an Etherpad, I got to like get out of my screen reader, go and it's those like little things that, that, you know, you work through. But now it's at a point whenever uh, our devs are thinking about a new feature or, you know, they're, they're, you know, cooking something up, they know that they can reach out to me and say, hey, Chris, I have a, a mock-up of this, a very early working prototype. You know, can you run it through its paces and see how, how it is so that they're not getting all the way to the end and they're putting this thing out in production and finding out, oh, man, there's all these, you know, issues from an accessibility standpoint. So, um so yeah, it's 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 been uh, it's been an evolution and a learning experience, but um, I'd have to say that you know it's it's been a, a, a real positive experience for all of us. So, sure. last chance. Any final questions, thoughts? No? All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>